my guests are usually very kind. Yeah, we should call one of them. <laughs> Let's see if anyone's available. They're usually very sweet and cooperative. Yeah, yeah. And then you called me instead. I should have dyed my hair like you. I don't have that problem. I have. I have. <laughs> My hair's naturally black. I've never dyed my hair. Why <sighs> people don't like you? <laughs> I can just shoot up with steroids all the time. It's got to be something going on with you. <laughs> well, it, 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 it helps to have a 16-year-old daughter. She kind of keeps you young. All right. Get going. You, you're down of eight minutes already. You've already used up one. Uh, so, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Okay. It's going to be very painful. Okay. <laughs> Listen, if I can get through uh, a show with Bobby Slayton, I can get through it with you. All right. All Here right, we let's go. go. Let's go. Stop it. Stop. My best side. Okay. Where's your Where's your wife? Is she going to join us at all? Not a chance. I may not join you. You better get going. We are going. This is going. <sighs> okay. So you, you know, one view. <laughs> and by the way, I'm going to edit this. So if you say something completely derogatory or against the law, I can edit it out. Just for your good. It's, it's, it's a probably a very good idea that you yeah, have. I don't want anybody knocking on your door, even though you're tucked away safely in Puerto Rico. All right. Okay, so we're here on the 80s golden age of comedy. Yeah. And uh, this is kind of going to be an unusual show. Sometimes I put warnings out there, you know, just to let people know that not everything they see in here is going to be really what it looks like. And this is going to be one of those shows because I have one of my oldest friends from show business. He may not acknowledge him being my friend. Wait a minute. You mean I'm your friend for a long time or I'm the oldest person that you know? No, 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 no. no. You're, you, know you might look like the oldest person I know. Listen, we all, we all don't use Grecian formula, my friend. Some of us just let nature happen. This is not, this is not, I, no, this is just, <laughs> I just looked 32 for the last 40 years. So anyway, when I was a an agent, not a, I think I was a, a, an agent for comedians. This has got to be back in, what, 87, do you think? When I, were you doing Charles? In the 80s. You were still living in your car at the time. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm not going to go there right now, okay? Walked on Melrose. I walked by. You were smoking. I went back. <laughs> that wasn't me. Oh, that wasn't you. Okay. I swear. Okay. I swear it wasn't me. I accept that. Okay. So, Banky, tell me where you grew up and how you got interested in show business. I grew up in Brooklyn. And uh, when I was... 14, my mother took me to California to visit some family, and I had never been to California. And my uncle knew a guy who uh, was a producer on The Price is Right. And he said, would you like to come see a taping of The Price is Right? Said, sure, go see a TV show, that'd be exciting. So he takes me there to the CBS studios on Radford, not Radford, where was it? No, in, uh, in the downtown uh, Fairfax area. Fairfax. So I'm on the set and he's showing me around and uh, I get a tour and it takes me into the control room and I'm just in awe of everything. I just am so excited by what I'm seeing and I'm asking everybody what they do. What do you do? What do you do? Oh, I'm the grip. And I'm like, that sounds stupid. And what do you do? And they tell me all the jobs and I asked the guy who was sitting in the, in the booth, what do you do? He says, I'm the director. I said, what does the director do? He says, well, and he explained to me what a director does. And I went, that doesn't sound good. He says, what? Anyway. <laughs> He wasn't impressed with me. But then I asked the guy what he does. He said, I'm the producer. I said, what's the producer do? He said, 
I basically run the whole thing. And I went, that's what I want to do. Bingo. <laughs> so that night I went home and I, I stood in the back of this room and watched the whole production behind the audience and just admired this whole production. I thought, one day I'm going to produce a TV show. And I went home that night and I told my mother, I'm going to be a TV producer. She said, oh, you want to do game shows? I said, no, I want to do sitcoms. She wow. said, yeah, I love sitcoms. I want to be a sitcom producer. So I decided. What, what was out at that time that you had a reference to sitcoms? It was based, it was all um, Hogan's Heroes. It was uh, the Brady Bunch. Uh, it was uh, starting to, I think. Yeah, they Mark, really hadn't hit the stride yet. Norman may have start, had a, uh, one or two by then, like, you know, One Day at a Time or something, or the Jeffersons, uh, certainly of Sanford and Son. And it might have been later than that, but I was always loving sitcoms. I, I'll tell you what I was a big fan of was uh, I Love Lucy and the Honeymooners. I couldn't get enough. I oh. This was, I was captivated by the brilliance of these shows, even at a young age. And I'll we'll get to it later, but I wound up at one point working for, well, you know what, I will tell you the story later. So... I told her I was going to be a sitcom producer. She said, that's nice, son. And that's what I made up my mind. That's what I was going to do. So everything I did from that point forward was towards that end. So I went to college for TV production and uh, became the manager of the TV station and produced a bunch of silly things in college. And then when I graduated, I got in my car and I drove to California with no contacts or connections and decided to uh, start knocking on doors. So I went to Paramount Studios. And I just tried to walk on the lot. And security says, well, you have a pass? Or where are you going? <laughs> no, but I want to be a think time producer. <laughs> they make me leave. Anyway, I, I, I just sat outside the studio for a couple hours one day, and I watched people come and go. And some people had passes, and some people were just famous. And other people had a clipboard and a stopwatch. And I noticed anybody who had a clipboard and a stopwatch, they just let right in. So I went and bought a stopwatch and a clipboard. Wow. Back the next day, and I'm wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses, and I'm staring at my clipboard, and I'm clicking the stopwatch like I'm timing shit, and I walk right through. Nobody stops me. Wow. So I wound up going around and passing out resumes, going under people's doors and annoying people as much as I could. And uh, I did the same thing at a bunch of different studios. And one day I was on an elevator. I had... Uh, to drop off a resume at someone who was expecting me, but the door opened on the wrong floor. Other people were getting out, and I looked in front of me, and it said, Norman Lear, Tandem Productions. Wow. And to me, at that time, he was the god. That was the mecca of sitcoms. And it was just like the universe opened up the elevator on the wrong floor for me and said, this is where you need to be. And I stepped out like into the light. Wow. And I said, where is your human resource department? She's right over there. The door's open. There's a woman behind the desk. I'll never forget her. Her name is Brooke Berman. And I said, can I talk to you for a minute? She says, okay. And I had every contact that I had made, I made an index card. And I filled it out, who I spoke to, when I spoke to them, if I gave them the resume, when I'm supposed to call back. And I had a hundred of them. And I showed them to her. I said, I'm, I'm really trying to get my foot in the door. And I want to you know, do what I can do. And she was so impressed. She said, I'm going to bring you on as a gopher, but we, we don't have a full-time position yet. So you'll be just on call. If somebody calls in sick or we need an extra one, how can I reach you? And I said, I have a beeper. And people didn't have beepers that much then. And she was like, you have your own beeper. I said, yes, just in case somebody needs me. Wow. Anyway, my beeper started going off. And I started doing things like delivering scripts for Red Fox and for wow. one day at a time people. And to me, this was unbelievable. Wow. I'm in my car. I don't know my way around anywhere. You have the Thomas Guide where you're looking at B-22. Oh, and all my God. And I'm driving around in my little orange Toyota Tercel trying to find these people's houses. And one day I had to deliver uh, the mustache for the guy who was on One Day at a Time. He played the uh, the mechanic, you know, the yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't a real mustache. I had to deliver the mustache to his house. Oh. Schneider. That was the name, Schneider. I'm like, this is Schneider's mustache. What? Anyway, I was impressed with everything. And one day I'm, I'm in the office and they're having me Xerox things. And a woman comes out and says, um, are you busy? I said, no, what do you need? Uh, Norman needs a box of pencils sharpened. Norman needs pencils sharpened? I'll do that. I'm, I mean, I'm in there going, zzz. I'm making sure they're really sharp, you know. And 
I put this box of pencils. I said, is he going to write a script? Yeah, he's going to write. Oh. I knocked on the door, and there he is in his little white hat. He says, come in. Come here. Thank you. And I walked out, and I it was like Moses on the mountain. You know, it was fantastic. Anyway, uh, one day they assigned me to uh, work on this special Norm was doing a uh, political thing he was doing called I Love Liberty. It was a big extravaganza to raise money for the Democratic National Party, which he was really well involved in. And um, so they hired a bunch of us to work on the show, basically just to get the celebrities, because it was star-studded, from their dressing room to the set and back, because it was being shot at the sports arena, a huge place, so golf carts to get around. And in the production meeting, they're assigning who gets what celebrity. And I'm the last one hired. So they're saying, all right, so you're going to get Mary Tyler Moore and you're going to get uh, Richard Dawson. And then it gets down to me and they said, okay, um, we're done. I said, wait, there's, you don't have anyone. Oh, yeah, there is one more. I'm sorry, Mitchell, you have, uh, his name is Carol Spinney. I said, who? He said, he's a, he plays Big Bird on uh, Sesame Street. Said, Big Bird. <laughs> So I'm walking around with this giant freaking yellow bird and they're going, all right, it's a celebrity. I'll take it. Then they assigned me to work on a show. I forget the name, but the writers of this show were named Bob Schiller and Bob Weisskopf. Do you remember those names? Do you ever hear of them? No. Schiller and Weisskopf were a writing team. They were probably in their 70s at the time. Wow. And been working together for decades. They had two desks pushed together, facing each other, partner's desks. And they bickered like an old married couple. I told you it's not funny. And I get assigned to work for these guys to, you know, be their gopher. And what I learned was these guys, if you look up the credits, they were the original writers on none other than I Love Lucy. Oh, my God. That's right. Now I'm working for the guys oh. who I Love Lucy. It's all coming full circle, right? So I'm like, so every day they ordered the same sandwiches from Jerry's Deli. The same things every day. So I had to go and pick up the sandwiches that were wrapped in the white paper. And I said I needed to get their attention because I wanted them to see me as a, a writer, a comedy writer. But they didn't want to be bothered. So before I brought the sandwiches in, I would unwrap it. And I'd write a funny story on the sandwich paper. And wow. I'd read the sandwich. So while they were eating, they would have no choice. Except wow. for the They got some mustard in there. But anyway, they saw it. <laughs> and after the first day, they didn't say anything. So the next day, I wrote more stories. Wrap the sandwiches, put them in. Third day, nothing. Fourth day, one of them came out and said, all right, enough. You're funny. And we know a girl who needs a comedy writer partner. We're going to introduce you to her. Ooh. Her name is Jennifer Burton. And Jennifer Burton was Al Burton's daughter. Ooh. So now I'm working with Jennifer, and we write a spec script for Silver Spoons. And we bring it to her father, Al Burton, who at the time was director of comedy development for Norman Lear. So she and I are writing together, and now he wants me to be his personal assistant. So now I'm working for Al. After about a year of being Al's everything, getting from getting his car washed to picking up his dry cleaning to writing spec scripts with his daughter, uh, he gets an offer from Universal to leave Norman's company and be an exec producer to try and develop new sitcoms for Universal. Wow. So he says he's leaving and he wants me to come and be his assistant. And like the ballsy guy I was, I said, I appreciate that, but it's time for me to move up and go further in my, my quest. I, so uh, do you have anything else besides being your assistant? He said, that's all I have. It's, you know, I'm going there new. I said, well, thank you anyway. I'm going to go out and see what I can do for myself. I wound up meeting a guy, I knew a guy of a guy of a guy that said uh, he could get me a job as a writer for questions on a game show. So it was one of these game shows where the questions were funny and you had to, you know, just be a game show question writer. I thought, all right, well, that's better than being his assistant. So I told him, I said, listen, I, I got hired or he's going to hire me to write questions. He says, I don't want to lose you, I said, but I, have, I can't just, he said, how about I'll make you director of comedy development for my company. Oh, my God. Your job will be to go through all the scripts that the literary agents send in and look for material for us to develop as a comedy. Uh. Now you're talking. Uh. You have a private office. You'll have your own secretary. Uh. I'm going to make five times more money than you're making now. I said, sold. So every day I would go home, 
with a stack of scripts like this and flip through it and just as garbage, 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 garbage. It was just depressing because nothing made me laugh. And I, it was, I was so picky and I didn't want to bring anything that was mediocre. And then one day I pick up the script and I start laughing on page one and page two and every other page. Every page was funny. Every page. And it was called Charles in Charge. And it was written by this young kid in New York named Michael Jacobs, who was at the oh time. Oh, my God. He's the youngest playwright ever in New York. He had put a play up on Broadway at like 23. So I brought it into Al the next day and I said, this is it. This is the one we're going to do. Wow. So he, we brought Michael out from New York and Michael and I became fast friends. And uh, so we sold it to CBS and then we were out. Uh, Al was out in Palm Springs for the weekend and he called me and said, I need you to put together a list of producers that we can bring an interview to produce the show. And I want you to come out to Palm Springs and, uh, and bring it to me and we'll talk about it. I said, okay, I'll do that. And I put together a list with one name on it. I remember the story. Handed him the paper. <laughs> and I went from no contacts or connections with the stopwatch and the clipboard to being the producer of a hit sitcom in about 18 months. And that's how I got started the business. Wow. Wow. Is that the wife? Yeah, it's the wife. And she's oh, the old. wife has to come and say hello, please. <laughs> Let me put some makeup on, yeah? All right, come back, please. Uh, <laughs> oh. That's Ruthie, you look so good. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. You know, out, of, out of everybody out in L.A., I miss you guys more than anybody else, but... Anyway, uh, and I know, try to be friends with this guy, and he always says, no, no, no. I said, all right. You don't miss your parole officer? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. Uh, Toolbox. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what were we saying? So Anything? I'll never forget the first time we met. Uh, I, I probably called you. And you were kind enough to say, yeah, all right, come over, show me what you got. And I was working with Howie Rapp at the time, I believe. Was this from a gay dating website or something? No, it was, but that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. All right. But, so I had a, like a bunch of uh, actors and actresses. And I, you were always looking for different actors and actresses to play some featured parts. And I represented a lot of, can you, can you do that later? She gets cranky if she doesn't have wine, and I can't get the cork out. Ah! All right, go ahead. She'll have to wait. And you, you said, yeah, come on by, and you left my name at the gate, and I walked into your office. Wow. It's a nice it office. Was, it was a nice office. Yeah, it was. So I don't think we ever did any, you know, any business together, but that didn't matter because my memory is we became friends. Just like you said, you kind of became, you know, fast friends with uh, Michael Jacobs. We, without me being a producer or a big hotshot, and I thank you, we were, we, we've been friends ever since. You know, I think because you gave me $20, I thought it would keep coming. Well, that's all I could afford at the time. I know, but I thought there'd be more. So anyway, it didn't work out. But you, you were you were a pleasant enough fellow. And then I was lonely. So. <laughs> it worked out for both of us. So, uh, and you became, you know, how many years did you do Charles? 35. Other than that? That's what it felt like. Um, I, I was probably six. Wow. I mean, I did every episode, so I think we did six seasons. And and you were really the the guy that uh, was in charge of uh, talent. I mean, they, everybody had to pass through you to get on that show. I wore a shirt that said, "I'm in charge of Charles." So tell me a little bit about that experience, about some of the uh, newer actors and actresses, uh, more probably the second part that came by your desk and you gave an opportunity to. I'm trying to think of the one in particular that comes to mind. Uh, 
Oh, God. My memory is just not what it used to be. Everybody feels, everybody's the same way I'm telling you. It's not just you. Uh, oh. Okay. She was, wait, no, she's a, she became a big star. She went from uh, doing some soap operas. She was like on sleep. She was in a movie Sleepless in Seattle. Oh, Meg, Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan. All right, Not so Ryan now let's back old. up. <laughs> okay, so let's see. We had uh, we had Leonardo DiCaprio did a guest spot. Wow. So didn't get it. And, um, and Meg Ryan played Scott's girlfriend on the first series. What you can do is you can push it all the way down and then just drink around. We're doing an interview here. Yeah, do an interview here. Uh -huh. you, you go, go away with that. Um, next question. So how was Meg Ryan? Because she's very know, sweet. People want to know that kind of stuff. She was very sweet. She really was. She was very sweet. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think bringing in new people to make them big stars was was a thing back then. Um, I, I know. I turned. I didn't hire uh, Cuba Gooding, who came in for a guest spot. Uh, for a twelve hundred dollar a day guest spot, and we're nah, he's not going anywhere. Oops. I tell you what, I do remember. I remember a lot of people coming in to audition for guest spots, and we I think it paid maybe twelve hundred, maybe two thousand dollars for a guest spot back then. People like Batman, Adam West, Adam West, and I'm sitting there. I'm 25, and Adam West is sitting on the edge of my couch going, yeah, so I really think I could do this. Like, oh, That's almost as good as the Honeymooners, isn't it? Wow, the old wham, bang, Batmans. Wow. Yeah. Um, speaking of Honeymooners, one day I'm walking down the rehearsal hall, and in one of the rehearsal rooms on some other show was Audrey Meadows. Oh. I don't get starstruck because I met everybody, but oh. I walked into that room, and I said, I just needed to say hello. and. <laughs> How much I admire you, and yeah, that was a great time. Wow, wow! So tell me about after Charles. I mean, also link me to the next thing after Charles. A lot of stuff that didn't go very far. Uh, the Torkelsons was a great show. Okay, uh, just didn't go anywhere. They scheduled us opposite big hit shows, and then said we don't have good ratings. Give us a time slot that we could use. But it was a good show. I was proud of that show. Um, did a bunch of weird shows. Did one with Paulie Shore called Pauly. We did a show with Betty White and Marie Osmond called Maybe This Time. It was so bad that the review came out and said, maybe next time. <laughs> we did a, a show about a, an ethnic show, as they called it then, called Where I Live, about these kids living in New York, and it was just terrible. Did a show called You Wish, which is even worse than that. It was about the genie. You don't remember the genie show? Oh, the genie show. It was wonderful. It was all special effects. This woman goes to a, a thrift shop and buys a rug. And when she opens the rug, a genie pops out. And thanks for releasing me from my rug that I've been in for a thousand years. And now I'm going to live with you and be a comedic foil for the single mother raising two kids. And he's going to be the other influence helping to raise the kids. And he does wacky things. Like she says, oh, I wish, one of the girls says, I wish I had a cat. And he goes like this, and there's 300 cats. <laughs> now, as the producer, I'm reading the script. And my job is to turn these pages into a show. So it says, so he snaps his fingers, and there's 300 cats. I'm like, 300 cats? I don't want to, no, we can't have 300 cats. No, no, we need the 300 cats, Mitch. We got to have 300 cats. So do you know what that's going to cost of 300 cats? Oh, we'll cut something else out. We need the 300 cats. I turn the next page, and then he snaps his fingers, and there's a dinosaur crushing buildings on Melrose. <laughs> and then they all laughed and said, all right, we're messing with you now. We don't need really. <laughs> Well, because you're not getting that. So can we have the cats? All right, you can have the cats. So meanwhile, we order the cats, and on the call sheet, they're supposed to be there at uh, 6 p.m. End of the day, last shot of the day, the cats show up. So that they're on the call sheet at 6 p.m. So at 6 a.m. I got a call from the stage. There's a giant giant tractor trailer filled with cages with 300 oh. cats in it. Oh. At 6 a.m. Like 6 p.m. It was supposed to be 6 p.m. Oh you know, these cats get paid by the hour. Oh. Now I got 300 cats on payroll for 12 hours. 
that show went a little over budget. <laughs> oh, my God. And everything was a special effect. Everything was a special effect. I'm like, can you just write funny words? You know, say funny things. That's why I love the Honeymooners. It's four people in one room. And it was hysterical. All in the family, four people, one room. You know, I love Lucy for the most part. Four people, one room. So it's, it's a formula. Norman knew what he was doing, and those people back in the day knew what they were doing. These people who just, they were lazy writers who just, you know, I can't think of anything funny, so let's make cats appear. <sighs> You'll be crazy. Anyway, so I did those fabulous shows. So, you know, I consider you, and it's one of the reasons why I kind of keep you around as a friend. I consider you one of the funniest guys I know. You really, really are one of the funniest guys I know. You need to meet more people. <laughs> oh no, people, really. But you know, you're the you're the twentieth show I've done with the funny, funny comedians make me laugh, but no one has ever made me laugh more than you. And can you explain that? Can you? Is there any way to explain humor? Um, no, there isn't a way to explain humor. And and what I find interesting is that there are people who find me very funny, and some people find me annoying. I don't know why, but honey, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But there's a prenup, so she's not going anywhere. Now, funny is just an individual thing. And, um, you know, when I did the warm-up, you know, I did all the warm-up for all my shows. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, what I was getting at is that I, I never had material, per se, because I'm, I'm not a comedian. Right. People would say, me, oh, you're funny. Why don't you do stand-up? And I said, I didn't do stand-up. I, I really look up to stand-ups. They're, they're a whole different breed. Me too. And they craft their material. Yeah. And they are real artists. And I'm just an improv guy in the sense that I, I interact with people. And somehow I filter information that I see and, in a, and I see it in a way that I find funny and can put a spin on it. But it's through interacting with people. It's never with material. So you want to talk about the warm-ups. It was, it was a great experience. You before know? you go there, before you go there, you know who used to be excellent at that? And I'm not talking about Robin because Robin could own a stage. But Howie Mandel did that in the beginning days. I remember Howie going up and down the stage, talking to this one, talking to that one, getting someone fun, then going across the stage, getting this guy to say, and then bringing it back to this guy over here. And that's what you're saying, is that you guys sound like a, you're kind of similar. Lift up your arms. No. Did, I, did I just do that? Yeah, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, it must be warm here. What are you in Panama? The hell? Are you in prison? Is that what that wall is behind you? Are you in prison? <laughs> are you in prison in South America? Is this an episode of Locked Up Abroad? Did I tell you not to smuggle kilos? I told you that in the eighties. You didn't listen. Oh Lord. Okay, I got to do this now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bruce. Oh, you are so bad, Banky. I'll tell you. I think I got some in my eye from you. I don't know how it got through the thing. Oh. If a doll in the quarter, you can get some band roll on. It's the, small, it's the travel size. It's all you need. <laughs> Baby powder. Wouldn't kill you. Just a little powder. Oh, so, all right. So, so, you know, the other thing that I'll never, ever forget is when I either visited California in 95 or six or 95 or six, and I came to see you on your very last day of your very last official producing days. You remember that? No. Yes, you do. From what show? The very last show you produced. You were literally putting things in a box. I happened to go there that I day. I had a lot of last days on a lot of shows with a lot of boxes. There were a lot of boxes. But I think this was the official. <laughs> End of your life. 
Your career is over. You're finished in this business. You'll never work again. Take your box and go. I, I remember that. You don't have to remember. But I remember, like, thinking, okay, I'm going to go see Banky, and he's working. Look at this. And he was putting stuff in a box, and it was your very last official production job. It was in a big box. <laughs> I, I the remember box. the box. It was, it was like a little... You? I didn't have anything. So, after that, you became, you're still friends with Michael Jacobs, and, you know, he never forgot you, I'm sure. Okay. I owe him money. <laughs> <laughs> so, you stayed in contact with him after the, after you stopped producing. And, and then what happened? Come on, keep going. And then, then I, you know, I, I, I started pitching shows on my own. You remember, you and I actually co-created a show called uh, America's Show. It's I, still it viable. Still viable. It's a great genius idea. And we pitched it to Glenn Padnick at, uh, at Castle Rock. And we said, we've got this great show idea where the audience will call in and vote. And he leaned back in his chair and said, audience will never call in and vote for anything. Exactly. You're the American Idol. We were the first show. And the last. So meanwhile, uh, between that and a few others that I had come up with, uh, one of them was called uh, Moment of Truth. And it was going to be a reality show about people who are wrongly convicted and sentenced to life. And we dig through cases and find people that we know were wrongly convicted. We've wow. got all the evidence to prove it, including back then when they were convicted, there was no DNA testing, but wow. we still have the DNA evidence and we go through the process and we can prove that they're innocent. And we, the show is about getting them out of jail and releasing the uh, wrongly convicted. Couldn't sell it. Between a few of those incidents like that, a plus I had created a game show, a game show called High Roller. Listen to this one. I met a guy who was a, a whale in Vegas, meaning a huge gambler. And he knew everybody. And he knew all the people who ran the Rio. And my idea was, this was just after Who Wants to Be a Millionaire came out, where game shows transformed from the $10,000 pyramid, where you could win $10,000. Remember a match game where you could win 400 bucks and they'd lose their mind? You know, they win a washing machine on Let's Make a Deal, and they scream like they to a million dollar game show. And I'm like, this, this is the beginning of something. So my idea was to do a game show set in Las Vegas where uh, the contestants compete by playing craps and roulette and slots and all these things. And without getting all the detail, we had a big meeting with all the executives at, uh, at the Rio. I had gotten the supervising producer from uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to come on board. So we had uh, a game show expert uh, to be part of our team, did a whole PowerPoint presentation and how the way you got to be a contestant is you played a certain bank of slot machines and one of the prizes you could win is you're a contestant. So it brought more people in to the casino. Plus, if you had to be a, a member of the Players Club at the Rio to be considered to be a contestant, love that. Love that. they were loving it. And they had this huge room that was only being used two nights a week, Friday and Saturday, because it was the nightclub. So the other five days, we could use it to shoot the show. Wow. We they gave us production offices uh, and and suites to live in. It was all done. Plus, there was going to be a whole thing of slot machines for our show that we were going to get a cut of. It was going to be huge. Wow. They're all excited about it. They can't wait to greenlight this thing. And we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And we got a call that this MGM or Harris just bought the Rio and fired everybody that we had been working with. And we're not interested in taking any meetings right now. And it was, oh my God! And I said, "That's it. I'm not doing this anymore. I, 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 I needed more control over my own destiny. And instead of having to always have someone else say, the show is good. We'll buy it. We'll pick it up. We'll do six episodes. We're going to cancel it. No, I have to get another pilot. And it was, it was good in my twenties. It was exciting and fun and great. Uh, but then you get into your thirties and you're raising a family and you want to know what your life is going to be like. So the internet was just starting to get born, and I said, I'm going to create an internet business, and that's what I did. So the, the other amazing times in our life, our memory, you've been a part of it, man, was 
when you were working with Michael on uh, Boy Meets World, a fantastic show. Some great people going through there. Definitely some of my best memories. And Lauren got a chance uh, because of you to be the massage therapist on the show and everybody loved her. And you were just, you were just, I'm not going to say you in your prime, but to me, that was really showing your talent. You know, it's fun. It's fun being um, a warm up for a show when you when you're not a, a paid comedian where that's your career and it's dependent. You know, you're dependent on that. Uh, I had the freedom to have a lot more fun with the audience because of my relationships. I mean, I could take people out of the audience and put them on the set. You know, warm up guys can't do those things. You know, you, you do your little warm up job and stay where you are. But um because of my relationships and you know being involved with the show, I could do a lot more stuff and I was never gonna get fired if I had an off night. So I didn't have that feeling of pressure. So I was able to just really be myself and, and have a great time. It was a lot of fun. Oh boy, was it, I mean, I, I don't think we missed a single week that you guys were shooting because uh, uh, at the least the food was delicious at the commissary. Well, you, you stopped after we, we called the police and said you were <laughs> Because there, there are stalker laws, and um, it's enough already, you know? Oh, those are great times. So did you have anything, you know, the show is the 80s golden age of comedy, and you certainly were a part of the, the golden age of comedy. I mean, uh, anyone who produced the kind of shows that you did, what was your, did you go to the improv in a comedy store and do what a lot of the other produce? Yeah, you went all the time. Oh yeah, was all the time. Yep, I remember going to the comedy store and watching Jim Carrey perform and thinking, "Holy crap, this guy sucks!" No, no, he was fantastic. I couldn't fantastic. believe. It. Yeah, fantastic. really amazing. And uh, I saw a lot of great comics there, and uh, and got a few off the stage and put them on the show. There was one comic I'll never forget though. He was I don't know who he is, but I wonder what ever happened to him. I thought he was really good, and when he came off stage, I got up and you know I was young, so people a lot of people didn't take me seriously. They, they didn't couldn't believe that I was what I would say I'm the producer of a sitcom because I was probably 24. Your hair was a little darker back then. I never liked you. <laughs> so we're clear. And everybody knows it now. All right. So after he came off stage, I walked over to the bar we were sitting and I said, listen, I'm a producer over at Universal. Um, I want to go back and finish seeing the other comedians, uh, but stick around and I'll come out and talk to you just looks at me and I go back in and usually that's what they're waiting for. You know, they're hoping for that kind of conversation. I came back out about 20 minutes later. I'm looking around. I don't see him. I said, well, what happened to that guy? He left. <laughs> he didn't go. He had a better opportunity. <laughs> anyway, it was fun. I remember you were always there. Uh, I think they called the police on you too. <laughs> You were there after they closed. They said, you have to go home now. And Rodney Dangerfield was there a lot in his pajamas, oh, yeah. which was a little peculiar, right? Yeah, yeah. And he had that nine-year-old midget on his lap all the time. I don't <gasps> know. That... But he also had a beautiful blonde wife. Yeah. Well, she was 17, though. No, no, she wasn't 17. She was... Oh, all right. She was, she, she was a proper age. But, uh, and that was in his later years. He had this beautiful blonde. I remember running into him at some some stores in Beverly Hills with his wife right next to him. And she was very attentive. And, you know, I had Bob Perlo on the show, who, yeah. you know, is a, a great guy and one of the, the not one of the, the first kind of of official uh, warm up guys at the sitcoms. Yeah. And, you know, he is he, he got me started, you know, so, you know, this show is funny with Bob and he was so funny and he he had brought in all these pictures that I could show everybody. And there were people, I don't know if, it, if Bob was one of them, but I had a lot of, I used to get a lot of phone calls when I was producing Charles from warm up guys saying, um, listen, I want to, uh, I want to talk to you about doing warm up for your show. I said, well, you know, I, I do the warm up for the show. Said, yeah, I know, but I'm really good. And you know, that, I'm not going to fire me, hire you. Nay, nay. It's an interesting pitch. I applaud you for it, but no. 
my job. And so you were one of the people that, uh, you know, you left the business on your own terms. And uh, I know you've been very happy because I've tried to connect with you on some different ideas. And you know how much you love my ideas. You know, I've tried to block you on social media, but somehow you keep finding these cracks. I have special software. <laughs> it's just somehow you get through these filters. I don't know. <sighs> I don't understand. But here you are, 85 years later, still plugging along in front of Friedman's wall. How is Bud? Is he dead? No, but he did have a stroke a few years ago. And so he's, I, you know, I, I just, I had Zoe on the show. That was really fun. Oh, Zoe. Who the hell is Zoe? His daughter. Okay. And, you know, she, she'd come through there and during the holidays because she lived with her mom in New York. And uh, she was always there, you know, smearing off and Goldstein and I would, you know, kind of spend a little bit of time with her and not babysit at all, but just it was fun. She was, she was right. And then she, it was great to hear her perspective of what was going on at the improv in those days. It was, it was a good show. Bud was a character. I mean, you, you probably introduced me to Bud. 15 times, and every single time, he would act like he'd never seen you before. Because you weren't famous. You didn't have a famous face. If you had a famous face... He didn't even look at you. He would, like, glance at you. Oh, hey, hey, nice to meet you. How are you? How are you? Hey, hey, hey. Such a character. But, you know, when, when, I, when I interview the comedians, they say... Mitzi and Bud were like the... They, they would have every kind of description from grandmother and grandfather and orphanage... Someone just described the beautiful Scheffler, as a matter of fact. I just did a show with the Mark Scheffler, and you worked together with him as a writer. Uh, he had fond memories of you, which I said you must be thinking of another Mitchell Bank. No, I was very pleasant in the 80s. But I was high. So. And, and, and you know, uh, I, I heard, like, uh, Gabe Kaplan became pretty good at uh, card playing and things like that. Well, that's what I do now. Professional poker player. Are, yeah. are you still going, physically going? I mean, I know you were doing it until, say, March. Psychically. I just go like this. And how, how, do you win? Do you oh, win? I win every time when I play like that. Yeah, no, I was just in Vegas a few months ago. Uh, won a tournament. It's, uh, it's, it's different now because you wear masks. And everybody's separated in plastic dividers. It's like, you know, the cone of silence on Get Smart. And everybody, you know, it's a social game. So you still try to talk to people, but nobody understands anybody. So it's like, <laughs> I, I, you can't see the gives and the, you can't see anything. That, the guy next to me was talking up a storm and he's looking through the glass and he's gesturing. He's talking to me. I'm like, I, I don't understand what you're saying. I lean back behind the plastic. So he leans back on the plastic and he's, rah, 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 rah. I still don't understand you. He pulls his neck and goes, Ain't all you should tell him that old shit. Fucking Chinese? Do I, does this look Chinese? Did you say you won that tournament? I've won a lot of tournaments. Wow. Did you, did, not that this is important, but I, I, the only other person I know is Gabe, you know, Gabe Kaplan. Do you, you run into him? Do you see him? Oh, yeah. On TV? No. Otherwise, no. Okay. okay. You're good at name dropping, though. I've got counted like 32. I'm keeping notes here. 32 times you've mentioned the famous person. Robin Williams. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? This has been... No, it has What a surprise. It has not been. So for those of you, you wouldn't know this, but I was texting this man right here and within the first sentence of me saying, had nothing to do with this show. He said, no. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Here's how the text started. So everybody knows the text started with, so you know, I've been doing these videos with comedians. I said, no. <laughs> so I know what's coming. But I don't know what happened. Maybe he's on some wacky juice right now. But he honored me and said yes and this has been so much fun can i go to the toilet now yes thank you
thank you. It's been a pleasure. And please say hello to your beautiful wife for me. And to and yours. We will. This is not a threat. We tried to do this a year or so ago. We will come down and visit. You know, the restraining order will be up in about three months, and then you're welcome. It's only a temporary. We'll Mitchell go. Bank, God bless you, my buddy. I hope for a long time to come. Great I guy. Can. One of the best reputations of any. Every time I say Mitchell Bank, everybody goes, great guy. So God bless. Thanks mm -hmm. for being on the show. And I'm going to take a shower now. <laughs> Let's pat yourself dry this time a little bit. Use a little. Anyway. Good to see you. Do me a favor and age a little bit next time. I see you. A little bit. Try. The uh, last thing you said was, get rid of those bushy eyebrows. What is the matter with you? I thought it was like caterpillars on your head. It was like antenna. What, I mean, the amount of Botox you must go through is just ridiculous. Do you drink it? Are you drinking the Botox? I'm all natural, man. I'm all natural. Yeah, keep your arms down. I what love you. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Many Scott Bayo questions. So tell me about Scott Bayo. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ask what actually happened with him and Nicole, please? I would like to know what happened with Scott Bayo and Nicole on your show. You ever see Hogan's Heroes? Yes. I think I know nothing. Oh, nothing. <laughs> I see nothing, I hear nothing, I certainly smell nothing. Oh, well, that was one of my favorite shows. Okay. I have to wait. Imagine how that pitch meeting went. They go in and say, I got an idea for a show. It's about a Nazi death camp. It's hilarious. <laughs> no, it'll be a screen. It'll be at an extermination camp with Nazis. And it'll be a riot. Let's do that. That's before there were Jews in the entertainment business. They never would have bought this thing. Oh, that's funny. That is funny.